where China played a role. But even then, uh, one very prominent uh, commodity exporter, uh, which is Australia, um, uh, you know, they has not had a recession for the last 25 years in a row. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we think that the, the Australian miracle, if you can call it that, is largely dependent, is a story, is the prox is a flip side story of Chinese miracle. So, Australia is some 30 or 40 percent export dependent on China. Uh, and uh, it's of course had its ups and downs in terms of unemployment going up and down and microeconomic fluctuations. But they never had a recession for 25 years. But I must say that Australian example is not merely the flip side of Chinese uh, road. I think there's something else to Australia which made it possible for them to have consistent economic expansion uh, without a break for 25 years. So that's just, a, you know, just to mention that in the China context. The, the, the third point is about um, trade, and I'm not so sure that uh, you, you, I mean, the observation is that the that, uh, that normal curve has shifted to the left. Um, and I think Arvind asked the question whether if it includes oil, then perhaps I don't know how much of the shifting to the left is simply the steep fall in oil prices. And, and um, it's in real terms, um, so it's deflated by prices. It's volume. So it's volume as well. Um, so that is something of great concern because uh, um, I think all that is done, uh, India is a net importer, but if you take away oil, uh, there is uh, there is a dependence on, especially for job creation, there is a strong linkage between manufacturing and industrial sector and exports. And um, after having had a double digit increase in exports for several years until recently, this is a matter of great concern. So this puzzle, if I may call it, is not very clear why, uh, of course it's true that it's shifted to the left, but if it's structural, uh, what is what is the reason? You, you ascribe it to the slowdown in demand, that is slowdown in, in, I guess, world GDP growth rates. But I just mentioned in my first point that I don't think the slowdown is so dramatic, especially when the, the largest two economies in the world are still uh, showing reasonably good numbers. Uh, then you mentioned that perhaps it's because of escalation or slowdown in tariff reduction, and therefore implying that emergence of trade barriers, and maybe non-tariff barriers as well. But this is of great concern to Indian policymakers. In fact, a very, very big concern. And I, I, I suspect that India's reaction sooner, uh, sooner or later is going to be similar, that there will be a lot of protectionism, uh, and they are already seeing some of that. Uh, and, and it's very heartening to note that you said actually the world, is in, the world has imposed much greater trade barriers against Asia than vice versa. I don't know if this, uh, I, I'm heart, it's, it's, it's something that we must publicize in a big way. Uh, but I'm not so sure whether uh, you're taking intra-Asia, so if you're ca calculating all the sanctions against Asian countries, many of them could be intra-Asia also. So Korea having sanctions against China, if it's count double counted, I just want to clarify. And uh, final point about, uh, again, in the context of trade. So I won't, I won't say anything about the uh, reforms, the last bit which you said, this is a, how do you get grow, more growth, uh, fiscal, monetary, trade policies, and structural reforms? And this is something which is of an ongoing and healthy discussion in India currently. So perhaps it will come up with a discussion. But the, my final point is about, again, trade, that uh, this protection, this tit for tat, you know, the decline of T, TPP or decline of enthusiasm for TTIP is further uh, aggravated by things like the, the retroactive tax for Apple. 13 years retroactive, which is actually seen s stealing tax money from the U.S. It's seen actually, uh, Apple is just an excuse, but it's basically the Europeans are stealing U.S. tax money, and therefore the U.S. has now slapped a $13 billion penalty on Deutsche Bank. So it's been seen as stealing, you know. So these are, you know, these episodes, I don't know how they're going to end up. But I think this is <coughs> also a contributor to this uh, declining enthusiasm for trade. But I hope it's only temporary. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll uh, go on uh, with Shankar Acharya, and then uh, I will be requesting Surjit Bala after that. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Maury, for that wonderful uh, uh, kind of uh, over, uh, explication of WEO, which we all sometime or other get to read, as you say, four times a year now. Well, I think there are two major and two updates. Yeah. 
and uh, um, that's really very, very uh, useful and interesting. Um, I have sort of three issues or questions. The first one will take five minutes, and the next two will take one minute each. <laughs> so, <laughs> just to just so that you don't worry. <laughs> the first one uh, harks back to what Ajit just said, uh, and I, I, I know Maureen can t tell us if his fa facts are right. But it certainly struck me as well that um, uh, every time there's a projection from the WTO, WEO, um, you know, it is uh, optimistic about the future, but that future never comes. And this is not just for the last. Uh, uh, two, three years, or even four years, but I, I suspect that it's really ever since the uh, global financial crisis and the Great Recession and so forth. But I, I haven't looked at the data. I'll be interested to know. Now, I mean, okay, that's happening. But, uh, and each time, you know, the WEO gives an explanation, looking back as well, and looking forward as well, and, you know, we find it very plausible. Now, I just wonder whether this could not be related to something which is a bigger thing that's going on. Uh, and it's been talked about uh, recently by various people, um, which is that, um, you know, this particular phase of globalization that we've seen since 1950, might it be just stalling or perhaps even reversing? Uh, and that's why, you know, all our premises really need to be rethought through in terms of how the future of the world economy goes looking ahead. Some of the sort of anti-globalization events, and I think this doesn't happen in one month or one year, but in the last eight, nine, ten years that have happened that come to mind, if I can just reel them off, I won't go into any of them. Okay, global financial crisis, certainly anti-globalization, Great Recession, ditto. Uh, the unresolved fiscal and banking strains in the Euro countries in particular, which have threatened not only the Euro, but perhaps even notions of European unity. Uh, the slowdown that Mori talked about in, and everybody talks about in China, of course, since the last five years, I guess. The crash in commodity prices uh, in the last two, three years. Uh, the prolonged wars in West Asia, as we call it from here, and uh, the civil wars in North Africa uh, also. Uh, the, and the associated um, military intervention and then blowback um, in the form of massive, massive refugee uh, flows. Uh, as Maury rightly pointed out, it was mainly to the neighboring countries, but with huge spillovers coming in the last year or two in Europe as well, which has uh, changed perhaps the nature of European politics more than marginally. The unexplained, uh, the unexpected Brexit vote and all that it portends, which, you know, if one listens to Ms. Madam Theresa May, uh, gets frightening every time. Um, the unexpected rise of Trump. Uh, as a Republican nominee. I mean, I don't think we've had a candidate like that uh, for a major party in the US. Uh, well, maybe Barry Goldwater, but I don't think he was that anti-trade, frankly. Um, the unsuccessful Doha round, uh, you know, long years of the so-called de development round, which got pretty much nowhere. And of course, what has been already said about the uh, uh, TTIP being on the ba back burner and even the TT TPP ratification is not looking that easy. Plus, perhaps, the rise of protectionism in individual countries. Now, all of this, I think, you know, each is a different thing, and one can talk about them separately, of course. But I'm just kind of, in order to be provocative, putting them all together. They've happened over a, almost a decade. And asking whether there's a structural break that is happening. And, the, this, I mean, causation runs both ways here. So it's just a question. Uh, it worries me. The other two questions I told you would take very short time. Um, one is, as we look forward now, if we go back to the earlier tem terminology of these global, doc uh, global documents from the multilaterals in Washington, uh, in the long, long ago I used to be associated with one of them, uh, documents I mean, and uh, institutions too, and uh, um, is uh, we used to talk in terms of the locomotor economies. And maybe that's a wrong thing to talk about. But uh, if I were to ask, uh, going ahead, which are going to be the locomotor economies for the global economy? Uh, one, is that a sensible question? And two, if it is a sensible question, what's the answer? And uh, last question, uh, and this is not covered, but I suggest it as a topic, perhaps, uh, for 
future WOs, unless it's already been dealt with in the past. I think uh, people in India are worrying more and more about the nature of labor-saving technical progress that seems to be sweeping industrial economies. Uh, you know, when you think about uh, things like um, artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, and a whole host of other things, uh, all of which could be interpreted as being, I think, elements of labor-saving uh, technical progress, which may be in one sense very good, but in another sense uh, they could be very job destructive in the way that we've defined jobs in the past. Uh, and not just in the industrial countries, but in terms of future possibilities in developing countries, particularly the ones where the demographic dividend is playing itself out still, like in India. So those are my three issues, questions. Thank you.